to be able to hear me. How's everybody doing today? Hotep, hey, this is Michael M. Hotep, founder of the African History Network, host of the African History Network show. I'm a talk show host, researcher, lecture writer, and historian. So it is Sunday, March 12th, 2023, and we are live. So I wanted to come on and uh, deal with this topic that I've uh, talked about before. And this deals with um, great African empires that Europeans tried to claim as their own. And sometimes Arabs try to claim them as their own as well. Um, so share this broadcast on your social media platforms. Invite your friends to tune in. It's a uh, great conversation. And also we'll give you information about a uh, 12 week online course that I teach called Ancient Kemet, the Moors and the Ma'afa, understanding the transatlantic slave trade, what they didn't teach you in school. All right. So let's look at a few of these um, African empires. And I have a lot of information uh, to share with you uh, on this topic. And there was a video that I shared on our Facebook fan page, uh, the African History Network, uh, shared it a few months ago, and it dealt with a um, it, it dealt with a European scientist who realized that the uh, ancient Egyptians and ancient Nubians were Black Africans. Okay, well, I'll show you that clip also. All right, so. Uh, we have the information and thread of our broadcast also to register for the uh, 12 week online course that I teach. So the first uh, African empire that we'll look at that Europeans tried to claim as their own is the uh, empire of ancient Nubia. OK, and also you, you'll hear referred to as Tasseti or uh, Tanehesi. When we look at so uh, ancient Nubia existed from 4500 B.C to uh, 500 AD, 4500 BCE, uh, before the Common Era or BC, before Christ to 500 AD or Common Era. Now, ancient Nubia or Tasseti, also known as Kush, the region, region was known as Kush, was a region along the Nile River located in uh, northern Sudan and southern Egypt. So today, the uh, lower portion of the Sudan, I'm sorry, the upper portion of the Sudan and the lower portion of Egypt historically was uh, known as Nubia, all right? And we know that the geographical boundaries that exist today in the 54 African uh, nations largely are the result of uh, the Berlin Conference of 1884 and 1885 that, um, was presided over by German Chancellor Otto von Bismarck. And these 14 European nations were going to carve Africa up into colonies. And they uh, draw the geographical boundaries around the areas that had the natural resources and the mineral wealth that the respective European nations uh, wanted. OK, so the first monarchy well, let me go back to that. Um, so the, located in uh, northern Sudan and southern Egypt. Now, it was home to some of Africa's earliest kingdoms uh, known for rich deposits of gold. Nubia was a major trading port for luxury goods that came from sub-Saharan Africa, such as incense, ivory and ebony. Now, the first recorded uh, the first monarchy recorded in history was established in ancient Nubia. Uh, the Nubians uh, were also known for exceptional archer, archery skills that uh, provided the military strength for their rulers. Uh, pharaohs or, or kings of Nubia ultimately conquered and ruled Kemet or Egypt for about a uh, hundred years. Monuments still stand in modern uh, Egypt and Sudan at the sites where Nubian rulers built cities, temples, and royal pyramids. Now, in the 1800s, the Western world's interest in uh, Nubia was awakened by the rediscovery of the ancient empire's uh, monuments, which were reported almost 
uh, simultaneously by individual British, French, and American explorers. Now, many of these European explorers found it difficult to credit indigenous Africans for building such a civilization. So they and, and so what we see here is the same thing that they did with Egypt. They tried to say that, oh, well, these were brown skinned Caucasians or these were um, uh, Semitic people or these were uh, uh, reddish skinned Caucasians anything except black Africans, because they don't want to have to admit that the it was black Africans who built these ancient civilizations that Europeans tried to claim as their own, but is also black Africans that you have enslaved uh, in the United States, in these various European countries also. When you talk about Great Britain, France, Portugal, etc., so they don't want to have to come out and admit. It's like, well, wait a second. You have uh, uh, these African people enslaved, all right, but you don't want to give credit to the civilizations that people built. And we know that African people did not stay uh, stagnant, did not stay stationary, so we migrated. And some of the migration was voluntary. Uh, some of the migration uh, was forced, okay, because of invasions. So we know that the uh, the Yoruba uh, uh, that are in Nigeria, as well as the Dogon of uh, Mali and Burkina Faso, okay, we know that they come from uh, ancient Kemet, all right? So we're going to see uh, African people migrate throughout uh, migrate from Nile Valley region of Africa to Central Africa to West Africa all right so many of them found it difficult to credit indigenous Africans for building such a uh, civilization we see the same thing with uh, Zimbabwe um, as well and then we also see when we look at the the Moors the African Moors, we see uh, Europeans try to claim that oh, all the Moors were Europeans. All right now, this video here, um, this is a European scientist who is disappointed when he finds out that ancient Egyptian pharaohs were black Africans. Ancient Egyptian pharaohs uh, were black Africans. And I'm going to see if we can... Uh, get this to play here i'm going to go to this let's switch over to it just give me a minute here all right let's flip over to uh this video all right let's a nubian creature which means that um, the ruling family was probably Nubian, and th that was unexpected. Examining Shemai's anatomy closely, the thickness of his bone and the shape of his nasal cavity, the anthropologists think he was a black African, likely from neighboring Nubia. A huge revelation that challenges the prevailing image of the Egyptian ruling class. We always thought the ancient Egyptian elites were Mediterranean type and in this sense Shema is representing the society of, uh, of the frontier in which different ethnic uh, groups were mixed. At the end it doesn't matter the color of your skin, Shema was Egyptian. The actual okay so uh, I want to try to I want to start that from the beginning. So just a second here. Let me uh, refresh that. So he, he said at the end, it doesn't matter the color of your skin. He was Egyptian, but he doesn't want to say who the uh, ancient Egyptians were. Surprise for Alejandro. Shemai's ethnicity. Well, they have just told me that uh, Shemai had a Nubian feature which means that um, the ruling family was probably Nubian and th that was unexpected. Examining Shemai's anatomy closely, the thickness of his bone and the shape of his nasal cavity, 
The anthropologists think he was a black African, likely from neighboring Nubia. A huge revelation that challenges the prevailing image of the Egyptian ruling class. We always thought the ancient Egyptian elites were Mediterranean type. And in this sense, Shema is representing the society of, uh, of the frontier in which different ethnic uh, groups were mixed. At the end, it doesn't matter the color of your skin. Shema was Egyptian. Okay, so why would you think that the ruling class in ancient Egypt, ancient Kemet, was Mediterranean? See, they... And they said they were shocked. They they were stunned. They were stunned that he's black African. Really? <laughs> these are the these are the type of games that they play. Okay, these are the type of games that they play. And then and then they're so shocked. Oh my God, these are Negroes. Oh my God, you mean like the Negroes that we enslaved and told the world were inferior, right? And and, and never contributed anything to world civilization never built societies, et cetera. We, we, you know, we made it illegal for them, for them to learn to read and write when they gave uh, reading and writing and literature to, to world civilization. They created world civilization. Oh my God, we can't, we can't let the world, we can't let the world know this, okay? <laughs> All right, now during the 1840s, German Egyptologist Carl Richard Lepsius who lived from 1810 to 1884, asserted confidently that the Greek term Ethiopian, when referring to the ancient civilized people of Kush, did not apply to Negroes, did not apply to Negroes, but was used to describe reddish skinned people closely related to the Egyptians who belonged to the Caucasian race. And, and when you read Nile Valley Contributions to Civilization, by Tony Browder, which is uh, one of the books that we use in the 12 week online course that I teach ancient Kemet, the Moors and the Ma'afa, understand the transatlantic slave trade, what they didn't teach you in school. And our next class is uh, Saturday, uh, March 18th. OK, 2 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Uh, Browder deals with some of the excuses that Europeans try to uh, try to give to explain away the Africanity of uh, ancient Egyptians, ancient Kemetic people, Nubians, things of this nature. Okay, they they would do mental gymnastics to try to say, oh no, these were not um, these were not Negroes. Okay, these were not Sub-Saharan Africans. Okay, these were um, Mediterranean. They were Mediterranean, or uh, they say the Greek term Ethiopian, and at one term. At one time, Ethiopia, all of Africa at one time was referred to as Ethiopia, okay? Even when you study uh, Greek mythology, and in high school I took a, a, a class on Greek mythology, even when you study Greek mythology, they tell you that Zeus, who was the king of the gods in Greek mythology, they tell you Zeus came from Ethiopia, all right? So um this is deep in their history and then you look at where they get the knowledge from when they, like the greco-roman soldiers when they conquer ancient kemet they they're going to learn from uh the ancient egyptians the ancient kemetic people and they're going to take uh the the little bit of knowledge that they learn they learn less than 10 percent uh they they're going to take uh the little bit of knowledge that they learned they take it back to greece and rome but they take it to other parts of the world. They also take it to Ireland as well. All right, let's continue. How's everybody doing? Give us a thumbs up. Give us a heart. Give us a like on this broadcast. All right. And uh, in the thread of the broadcast, we have the information so you can register for the 12 week online course that I teach ancient Kemet, the Moors and the Ma'afa. Understand the transatlantic slave trade, what they didn't teach you in school. I teach that normally on Saturdays, 2 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. And then uh, today, uh sunday uh march 12th at 4 p.m eastern standard time uh we're doing a, a special session of uh, my sunday class which is uh that class is black resistance movements um from the haitian revolution to the u.s civil war civil rights movement the black power movement 
1968. Uh, we're doing a free class session of that uh, course uh, today at 4 p.m. Eastern Standard Time because the daylight savings time is throwing my whole schedule off. So then I have to do my radio show tonight at 9 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. So uh, you can register for uh, today's class, uh, 4 p.m. Eastern Standard Time at, at our online school. And uh, we'll post the link here also so you can uh, register for that as well. OK, but we have it here in the, in the uh, thread of the broadcast. All right, let's continue here. Okay, so they said that um, uh, during the 1840s, German Egyptologist Carl Richard Lepsius um, said that the Greek term Ethiopian, when referring to the ancient civilized, ancient civilized people of Kush, did not apply to Negroes, but was used to describe reddish skinned people closely related to the Egyptians who belonged to the Caucasian race. Was he trying to imply that Negroes were not civilized? Is that what he is that what he was trying to imply? Now, um, Nubia was the first recorded monarchy. The first recorded monarchy. Now, ancient Kemet or Egypt is the first major civilization in Africa for which records are abundant. It was not, however, Africa's first kingdom. A March 1st, 1979 uh, New York Times uh, front page article uh, written by journalist Boyce Rensberger, Boyce Rensberger. Uh, reported, quote, evidence of the oldest recognizable uh, monarchy in human history preceding the rise of the earliest Egyptian kings uh, or pharaohs in the, or in the Subites by several generations has been discovered in artifacts from ancient Nubia, has been discovered in artifacts from ancient Nubia. Now, the artifacts, including hundreds of fragments of pottery, uh, stone, uh, stone vessels and ceremonial objects such as uh, incense burners, were initially recovered from Kustel, uh, Q-U-S-T-U-L, uh, cemetery by Keith C. Seal, S-E-E-L-E, -E, a professor at the University of Chicago. OK, now, what is a monarchy? What is a monarchy? Right now, a monarchy is a political system based upon the undivided sovereignty or rule of a single person. So like a king could be a queen uh, as well. All right. Uh, the term applies to states in which supreme authority is vested in the monarch and who is an individual ruler who functions as the head of state an individual ruler who functions as the head of state and who achieves uh, his, or, uh, his or her position through heredity, usually through heredity. Most monarchies allow uh, only male succession from father to son, okay? For more information, check out uh, uh, Britannica.com. They have some good uh, basic information on uh what a monarchy is okay and it's listed under monarchy now uh ancient nubian artifacts yield evidence of earliest monarchy this was a march 1st 1979 new york times article okay and in the article it says uh evidence of the oldest recognizable monarchy in human history uh, preceding the rise of the earliest uh, Egyptian kings by several generations has been discovered in artifacts from ancient Nubia in Africa. Until now, it had been assumed, until now it had been assumed, assumed that, that at the time, the ancient Nubian culture, which existed in what is now northern Sudan and southern Egypt, 
had not advanced beyond a collection of scattered tribal clans and chiefdoms. The existence of rule by kings indicates a more advanced form of political organization, okay? Indicates a more advanced form of political organization in which many chiefdoms are united under a powerful and wealthier ruler. The discovery is expected to stimulate a new appraisal of the origins of civilization in, in Africa, raising the question of to what extent later Egyptian culture may have derived its advanced political structure from the Nubians. The various symbols of Nubian royalty that have been found are the same as those associated in latter times with uh, Nesubites or pharaohs or Egyptian kings. So um, Nubia or ta -Nehesi is the mother, okay? Nubia or ta -Nehesi is the mother. And the grandmother of ancient Kemet is Abyssinia or Ethiopia, all right? So all those civilizations are connected. Uh, you're dealing with Nile Valley region uh, civilization. All right, give us a thumbs up. Give us a heart. Give us a like on this broadcast. Be sure to register for uh, this 12-week online course uh, that I teach where we get deep into a lot of this information. It's called Ancient Kemet, the Moors, and the Ma'afa, Understanding the Transatlantic Slave Trade, what they didn't teach you in school. Uh, our next class is... Uh, I do teach this class normally on Saturdays, 2 p.m. to 4 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. My next class is Saturday, March 18th, uh, 2 p.m. to 4 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. And we have the link for the class uh, for you to register for the full 12-week online course. We have it here in the thread of the broadcast. I'll post it again as well. It's right on the homepage of our website, theafricanhistorynetwork.com, theafricanhistorynetwork.com. So we have information about our uh, Sunday night radio show, 9 p.m. to 11 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, the African History Network show, PayPal cash app information. And then our 12-week online course. This is classes on sale, uh, $80, regularly $130. Next class is Saturday, March 18th, um, and you can register for it. We do the sessions live. All the sessions are archived and recorded, so you can go back and watch it any time. Just click right here to register for full course. So if you missed our class on uh, Saturday, uh, May 11th, we had a great class Saturday, May 11th. Uh, as soon as you register, you can uh, start watching that class, okay? And even a year from now, two years from now, you can go back and watch the entire course. So it doesn't, uh, your access uh, does not expire. Uh, on Sundays, normally 2 p.m. to 4 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, uh, I teach Black resistance movements from the Haitian Revolution to uh, the U.S. Civil War, Black uh, uh, U.S. Civil War, Civil Rights Movement, and Black Power Movement, 1800 to 1968. Okay, so our next class is going to be Sunday, March 12th, special time, 4 p.m. to 6 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. We're starting later today because of uh, daylight savings time. Okay, same structure for this class. You can register for that one as well. And today's class, we're, we're going to give away a free class session. So we have the link here in the thread of the broadcast. You can register for the free class session, but you can also register for the full 12-week online course also, okay? And we look at history chronologically uh, from 1800 to 1968 to see what happened to us, uh, what leads up to the Civil War taking place, what happens um, after slavery ends, uh, what were the laws and policies put in place to put us where we are today to understand where we need to go from here. So we deal with the... Uh, U.S. Civil War, Reconstruction, 1865, 1877, Jim Crow era. Uh, we deal with the voter suppression tactics that were used in the South. Jim Crow era, World War I, World War II, uh, Civil Rights Movement, Black Power Movement, and the Great Migration of 1915 to 1970. All right, so that is uh, Black resistance movements. And and when we look at this 18, um, 1800, 1968, that period of time we highlight the black resistance movements that were taking place during that period of time and we know black resistance movements is the 2023 annual theme for black history month okay there's been an annual theme for black history month 
going back to 1928. Black resistance and black resistance movements was the 2023 annual theme uh, for uh, Black History Month. OK, so I'm going to post the um, we're going to post the link here so you register for uh, today's uh, free class session. Also, uh, let me put that um, here. And we'll do that at uh, 4 p.m. Eastern Standard Time today. Just a second here. All right. Okay, let's continue. Okay, so the discovery uh, is expected to stimulate a new appraisal of the origins of civilization in Africa, raising the question of what, of to what extent uh, latter Egyptian culture may have derived its advanced political structure, political structure from the ancient Nubians. The various uh, Nubians, uh, the various uh, symbols of Nubian royalty that have been found are the same as those associated in latter times with um, ancient Egyptian kings or, or, or pharaohs. The new findings suggest that the ancient Nubians may have reached this stage of political advancement as long ago as 3300 BCE before the Common Era or BC before Christ several generations before the earliest documented Egyptian king. The, uh, the discovery is based on study of on the study of artifacts from ancient tombs excavated 15 years ago, about 15 years prior to 1979, okay, 15 years ago, in an international effort to rescue archaeological deposits before the rising waters of the Aswan Dam covered them. Okay, so read read this article from 19 March 1st, 1979, from the New York Times. Ancient Nubian artifacts yield evidence of earliest monarchy. Okay, so we have Nubia, which is a um, African uh, civilization, African empire. The Europeans try to claim as their own, but we also have uh, Carthage. Okay. Carthage in North Africa in the area uh, that today is where Tunisia is, all right? Now, Carthage existed from 813 uh, uh, BCE before the Common Era uh, to 146 BCE, and we're gonna, uh, we've heard about the Punic Wars between uh, Rome and Carthage, and Carthage is gonna be destroyed in 146 uh, BCE uh, by Rome, okay? And we read about Hannibal Barca uh, fighting against Rome and the Punic Wars and Hannibal uh, crossing the Alps with the elephants. And we read about uh, the Battle of Cannae, uh, 216 B.C., uh, all of that. OK, and we go through and talk uh, talk about that uh, in the uh, 12 week online course that I teach as well. OK, so there was a uh, back in. 2016 there was a series on the history channel called barbarians rising barbarians rising and barbarians rising dealt with a uh a 700 year history of invasions in the roman empire okay 700 year history of invasions in the roman empire and it dealt with um, the the first installment, first episode was about Hannibal Barca fighting against the uh, Romans. Okay, they had this black British actor named Nicholas Pennock portray Han Hannibal Barca, and some white people on social media lost their minds behind this. There was an article from AtlantaBlackStar.com that talked about this. They said History Channel's newest documentary series, Barbarians Rising, Barbarians Rising, uh, tackles the fall of the Roman Empire over the course of 700 years of invasions. However, the most recent episode that aired uh, Monday, this is in 2016, 
depicts Hannibal of Carthage as a black man, depicts Hannibal Barker of Carthage as a black man. Uh, and many white history buffs are crying foul over the quote unquote historical inaccuracy or what they call a historical inaccuracy. In the series, Hannibal Barker is portrayed by a uh, black British actor, Nicholas Pennock, who there's no question that he's of African descent. OK, he's not you don't have to look at him for five minutes and try to listen to the tonality of his voice to determine if he is of African ancestry. Now, the famous Carthaginian uh, general Hannibal Barker was a thorn in the Roman Empire side. He became a general at the age of 26 and managed to unite barbarian tribes to stop to, to stop Rome's imperial rise. The military genius was famous for climbing the Alps with war elephants whose sole purpose was to stomp the Roman Empire, to stomp S-T-O-M-P, to stomp the Roman Empire. Hannibal ultimately wanted to invade Rome, but he failed to do so. OK, now um, there have been debates over the race of Hannibal. This debate still continues to this day for some people. This really is no debate if you understand history. I read the article from AtlantaBlackStar.com from June 7th, 2016 called History Channel Portrays Hannibal as Black. White people cry foul over historical revisionism. All right. Uh, now, when we look at uh, Carthage, Carthage was founded in the 9th century BCE before the Common Era on the Gulf of Tunis. From the 6th century uh, before the Common Era uh, onwards, it developed into a great trading empire covering much of the Mediterranean and was home to a brilliant civilization. In the course of the long Punic Wars from 264 BCE to 146 BCE, Carthage occupied some of Rome's territories before finally being destroyed by its rival Rome in 146 before the Common Era. In his book, World's Great Men of Color, Volume 1, history scholar J.A. Rogers asserts, quote, the Carthaginians were descendants of the Phoenicians, a Negroid people. The Carthaginians were descendants of the Phoenicians, a Negroid people, and that, in fact, until the rise of the doctrine of white superiority, Hannibal Barker was traditionally known as a black man, end quote. So what we're going to see as you have a rise in European powers and, and Europeans are coming out of the Dark Ages as they come out of the 1200s going to the 1300s, uh, which is the, the beginning of the Renaissance period. Uh, as they come out of uh, th that time and go into the 1400s and 1500s, we're going to see them conquering people's lands, especially, especially in the 1400s. We're going to see them conquering people's lands, like with uh, Christopher Columbus, and then we look at the Juan Ponce de Leon in, in the 1500s. Uh, in 1513, he comes into Florida uh, and conquers Florida on behalf of Spain. And Europeans start to enslave uh, people, not just African people, but also Indians, Native Americans. They start to enslave them, extract mineral wealth out of those uh, respective uh, nations. And they start to rebuild Europe. As you have a rise in the dominance of European powers, you also have a rise in the dominance of the European phenotype in a lot of mythological characters get reinterpreted as european that were originally african and some historical characters some historical personalities also get reinterpreted and some historical people groups of people get reinterpreted as european that were historically african um and we're going to see this depicted in paintings we know that Europeans were worshiping the black Madonna and child for hundreds of years all throughout Europe. OK. And that comes from uh, the worship of Asar, Aset and Heru, who the Greeks called Osiris, Isis and Horus. OK. Known as the first Holy Trinity. And we're, we're going to see that um, Michelangelo painting the Sistine Chapel. He depicts. Adam and Eve as being European. 
He depicts God as being European. And we're going to see, um, you know, there were hundreds of images and statues of the Black Madonna and child all throughout Europe. France probably had the most with somewhere around 300. And we're going to see the colonization or decolorization of these African images to European as well. And there's going to be these European images that these Europeans take into foreign lands when they conquer people and force these images and force Christianity, what especially white, especially white Christianity, force these upon uh, other groups of people, especially African people. OK, let's continue. Give us a thumbs up. Give us a heart. Give us a like on this broadcast. How you all like this type of information? Who still needs to register for the 12 week online course that I teach normally on Saturdays? Ancient Kemet, the Moors and the Ma'afa. Kemet, one of the original names for Egypt. Ancient Kemet, the Moors and the Ma'afa. Understand the transatlantic slave trade where they didn't teach you in school. Also, be sure to register uh, uh, for today's free class session of uh, black resistance movements from the Haitian Revolution to the uh, U.S. Civil War, Civil Rights Movement, and Black Power Movement, okay? We're doing that class uh, Sunday, uh, March 12th, 4 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Normally, it's 2 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, but we're doing it at 4 p.m. East, 4 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, and we have the uh, link to register for uh, the free class session today. We have that here in the thread of the broadcast, and we have uh, the post on our Facebook fan page, The African History Network, the African History Network and um, my YouTube channel, uh, uh, as well as my personal Facebook page, Michael M. Hotel. OK, and I'll post it here. Uh, I'm going to post it here again on the thread of the broadcast. All right, let's continue. So today, uh, many encyclopedias classify the Carthaginians who are descendants of the Phoenicians and the Phoenicians were African people as well. Um, today, many encyclopedias classify the Carthaginians as whites or Semites, but ancient Greek and Roman eyewitness accounts paint a different picture. The indigenous peoples of Carthage were called the Aphirs, the Aphirs, A-F-E-R-S. Ancient Roman poet Virgil um, in his poem, Mortum, Mortum, M-O-R-T-U-M, speaks of a woman from the Afir, Afar, or uh, Afro region, okay, the Afro region. He says of her, quote, and all her figure proves her native land. Her hair was curly, thick her lips, and dark her color, end quote. Now, in Library of History book 20, XX, Roman numeral X, okay, represents 10. In Library of History book uh, 20, Greek historian Diodorus mentions a Greek lieutenant named Agathocles who defeated a people in the area of present-day Tunisia who were the same hue or color as Ethiopians. The eyewitness accounts are corroborated by physical anthropology. L. Berthelon, L. Berthelon and E. Chantre, L, uh, initial L and initial E. E. Chantre, both well, no, well noted French anthropologists, documented their examination of skeletons throughout North Africa in all periods. They note that the remains of both upper and lower class individuals of ancient North Africa were representative of the Negroid race, were representative of the Negroid race. Now, another African empire that Europeans try to claim as their own is Great Zimbabwe, okay? Great Zimbabwe, which existed from 1220 uh, common era to 1450 uh, common era or AD. AD meaning Anno Domini in the year of our Lord. And as I've said before, and, and we deal with this in the classes that I teach, 
there's a uh, attempt to get away from the Christian dating system of BC and AD, B BC meaning before Christ. Uh, there's an attempt to get away from that. And that was largely championed by um, the Venerable Bede, an English monk named Bede, B E D E, okay, around, around 8th century uh, AD, common era, okay, around 8th, 8th century common era. So there's an attempt to get away from that and use uh, BCE before the common era and uh, BC, which means common era. All right, let's continue here. Now, the civilization of Great Zimbabwe was one of the most significant civilizations during the medieval period. Uh, Great Zimbabwe is extraordinary because of the magnificent scale of its, of its structure, the magnific magnificent scale of its structure. Uh, of its structures, I should say, plural. Um, its most striking edifice, referred to as the Great Enclosure, has walls as high as 36 feet extending approximately 820 feet, making it the largest ancient structure south of the Sahara Desert. Now, in the 1800s, uh, European explorers, imperialists, and colonizers were stunned by Great Zimbabwe's grandeur and cunning workshop, uh, work workmanship. It's grandeur and cunning workmanship. So they attributed the, the architecture to Portuguese travelers, Arabs, Chinese, Persians, or even biblical characters such as King Solomon and the Queen of Sheba, which is like really, really, really problematic. Okay, we're not going to go deep into that right now, but that's really problematic when you try to attribute physical structures to biblical characters that's that's a that's a huge problem there that means like you really you're really desperate when you do something like that if you if you know what i mean now according to the metropolitan museum of art archaeological investigations conducted during the first decades of the 20th century have dismissed those attributions to, to the Arabs and the, and the Chinese and the Persians and the Portuguese and, uh, you know, things of this nature and biblical characters, etc. According to the Metropolitan Museum of Art, archaeological investigations conducted during the first decades of the 20th century have dismissed uh, those attributions and confirmed both the antiquity of the site and its African origins have confirmed both the antiquity of the site and its African origins. It was built by the ancestors of the indigenous Shona people, S-H-O-N-A, in the 11th, 11th century common era, or what the, the Venerable Bede called A.D., long before the first Europeans ever set foot in Zimbabwe, okay? Yet and still, this is another great African empire that Europeans tried to try to take the credit away from African people and give it to everybody like the Chinese and Portuguese and Arabs, etc. OK, and when you have oppressed the people, enslaved them. And then now, and see also with the invention of the Gutenberg printing press in uh, about the 11th century AD, mid 11th century AD, somewhere around 1046 or so, with the invention of the Gutenberg printing press, named after Johannes uh, Gutenberg. Now, with the Gutenberg printing press being invented, now they can mass produce manuscripts. They can mass produce books. Prior to prior to that, all the books were handwritten, okay? But when the printing press, the Guten, Gutenberg printing press was invented about mid-11th century um, common era, 
Now, Europeans can mass produce the lie. They can rewrite the history and mass produce the lie. Okay, so another great African empire that Europeans try to claim is still and claim as their own, represent to the world as their own, was Namibia. Not Namibia, but Namibia, N U M I D I A, which existed from 202 BCE before the Common Era to 46 BCE. Now, Namibia uh, was another great black Berber Libyan nation in northern Algeria during the time of the Romans and the Carthaginians, okay? And, you know, Han uh, Hannibal Barca, uh, the, the, the Punic Wars, Carthage, okay? Because Carthage is um, not destroyed until 246, uh, sorry, until 146 BCE. Now, it began as a sovereign state and later alternated status between a uh, Roman province and a Roman client state. Uh, it is considered to be the first major state in the in history of Algeria and the Berber world. OK, it's considered to be the first major state in history uh, in, in, in the history of Algeria and the Berber world. Now, the media has also been classified by European and Arab historians as a Caucasian or Semitic built civilization. Now, in his famous, his classic book, The Destruction of Black Civilization by Dr. Chancellor Williams, and I have that book here in the office also, because uh, we referenced that book in um, my 12 week online course, Ancient Kemet, the Moors, and the Ma'afa, Understanding the Transatlantic Slave Trade. Dr. Chancellor Williams declared that Libya was once so nearly all black that to be called a Libyan meant that one was black, that to be called a Libyan meant that one was black. The Greek historian Herodotus writing about uh, Libya in his book, Histories, book four stated, one thing that I can add about this country, so far as one knows, it is inhabited by four races and four only of which two are indigenous and two are not. Two are indigenous and two are not. The indigenous peoples are the Libyans and Ethiopians. The former occupying the northerly, which means the Libyans occupying, occupying the, north, the northerly, and the latter, the more southerly parts, the Ethiopians occupying the more southerly parts. The immigrants are the Phoenicians and the Greeks. The immigrants are the Phoenicians and the Greeks. Now, one of the most, uh, end quote. Now, one of the most famous Berber Moors of the Roman times was uh, Masinissa, okay? Masinissa, M-A-S-I-N-I-S-S-A, -S -S -A, who was the king of Numidia. Uh, from, uh, you're looking at... Uh, uh, he lived 238 BC to uh, 148 uh, BCE, 238 BCE to 148 BCE. And it's Masinissa who assisted the Romans against the Carthaginians during the Punic Wars. When you study the Punic Wars and we deal with the Punic Wars in, uh, in, in the course, we deal with Masinissa siding with the Romans against the Carthaginians. OK, to defeat to defeat the Carthaginians. Now, the uh, the coin depictions and statues of King Masinissa confirm without doubt that this great Berber leader and king of the Moors was phenotypically a black African man with woolly hair, similar to uh, the uh, West African type. Uh, suffix S Y P H A S Y P H A X, uh, king of the uh, Mas uh, Masicilians in Namidia, a contemporary and great rival of King Masinissa, was also depicted in his coinage as a phenotypically black African. 
Now, this coin that you see here on the screen, front and back, uh, this is the coin of Juba the first, J-U-B-A, uh, who lived from 85 BCE to 46 BCE. He was king of Namidia um, as well. Okay. And uh, Namidia is in present day Algeria and Tunisia in North Africa. Because once again, those geographical boundaries that we see today, those uh, largely come from the Berlin Conference of uh, 1884 and 1885. There's a good article dealing with the Berlin Conference. Uh, There's a good article from... Um, thoughtco.com okay and let me pull this up here this deals with the berlin conference to divide africa the berlin conference to divide africa let's look at this the Berlin Conference to Divide Africa, the Colonization of the Continent by European Powers. Okay, now here's a sketch of these European leaders uh, meeting at the Berlin Conference to carve Africa up into colonies. Because these Europeans have been fighting and killing each other for hundreds of years, going back to when they were barbarians and um, formed uh, kingdoms. Okay, you know, the Anglos, the uh, Anglos, the Saxons, the Jutes, the Lombards, the Picts, the Alans, the Franks, the Vandals, the Visigoths, etc. Okay, and then they're going to uh, form uh, nations. The barbarians go from kingdoms to nations, and these nations are going to continue fighting and killing each other. The Berlin Conference was Africa's uh, undoing in more ways than one. The colonial powers superimposed their domains on the African continent. By the time independence returned to Africa in 1950, the, or in, in the 1950s, uh, beginning with um, Ghana in 1957 under Kwame Nkrumah, uh, the realm had acquired a legacy of political fragmentation that could neither be eliminated nor made to operate satisfactorily. Now, let's see here. What was the purpose of the Berlin Conference? In 1884, at the request of Portugal, German Chancellor Otto von Bismarck called together the major Western powers of the world to negotiate questions and end confusion over the control of Africa. To negotiate questions and end confusion over the control of Africa. Now there was no, there were no representatives uh, on behalf of Africa there, just so people understand, okay? I don't want anybody to be confused. Now Otto von Bismarck, German Chancellor Otto von Bismarck appreciated the opportunity to expand Germany's sphere of influence over Africa and hoped to force Germany's rivals to struggle with one another for territory. At the time of the Berlin Conference, 80% of Africa remained under traditional and local control. What ultimately resulted, what ultimately resulted was a hodgepodge of geometric uh, boundaries that divided Africa into 50 irregular countries divided africa into 50 irregular countries now we know the 54 countries now um irregular countries this new map of the continent was superimposed over 1000 indigenous cultures and regions of africa the new countries lacked rhyme or reason and divided coherent groups of uh, african people and merged together uh, disparate groups who really did not get along, okay? And it shows uh, the map here of Africa and it shows the different uh, regions that these respective European nations uh, got. Okay, read the rest of this uh, article from thoughtco.com. 
the Berlin Conference to Divide Africa. The Berlin Conference to Divide Africa. All right. Let's continue here. Um, so the last African nation that will, last African empire that will discuss that um, Europeans lie to the world and try to claim as their own, try to steal the credit from African people is Axum. So Axum existed from about 100 AD common era to 940 uh, common era. So the kingdom of Axum was a powerful Ethiopian Eritrean empire located in northern, Ethio northern Ethiopia and Eritrea. It developed its power by controlling the Red Sea trade routes. Axum was uh, ruled by the Negus Negast, Negus Negast, which means King of Kings, under King Azana, uh, E Z A N A. Axum was the most powerful empire in Northeast Africa, and in 350 Common Era, Common Era or AD, uh, Axum sacked the Nubian Kingdom of Moro. In the latter part of the fourth century common era, Axum invaded the southern part of the Arabian Peninsula and occupied Yemen from, 350, from 335 common era to 370. At its height, Axum included the surrounding Ethiopian highlands, Beja, uh, 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 Noba, Kasu, and Arabian kingdoms, uh, Hemyar and Sabar. The kingdom of Axum was prosperous from 100 common era to 700. It was contemporary with the Roman Empire. And according to the Persian a religious leader, Mani, M-A-N-I, um, the Axumite civilization was third among the four greatest of the time on par with Rome, Persia, and China. A theory about the origins of Axum was that it was founded by Semitic speaking uh, Sabians, S, uh, Sabians, S A B A E A N S, who crossed the Red Sea from South Arabia, uh, which is modern day Yemen. However, scholars now agree that the uh, Sabian uh, influence was negligible and the kingdom was founded by indigenous Africans. Okay. All right. So this deals with some African empires that Europeans tried, to, Europeans lied to the world and tried to say were Europeans, and in some cases try to say they were Arabs, but these were created by black Africans, these civilizations. All right. Um, hopefully you like this type of information. And uh, there was a uh, article from uh, AtlantaBlackStar.com also called Ancient African Empires Besides Egypt that Europeans and Arabs tried to claim as their own that you can check out uh, for more uh, information as well. OK, and this is just a sample of the type of information that we deal with in the uh, 12 week online course that I teach uh, ancient Kemet, the Moors and the Ma'afa. Uh, understanding the transatlantic slave trade where they didn't teach you in school. Okay, so we deal with thousands of years of history and uh, what leads up to uh, the transatlantic slave trade taking place, okay? And when we deal with the transatlantic slave trade, we can't start uh, studying our history in slavery. We have to deal with thousands of years of history that leads up to uh, the transatlantic slave trade taking place. We can't start in 1619, with the Portuguese, we can't start in the 1440s. And uh, we have to deal with thousands of years of history chronologically that lead up to the transatlantic slave trade taking place. But also we, have to, also we have to understand the 800 year occupation of Europe by the Africans known as the Moors who go into the Iberian Peninsula today known as uh, Spain and Portugal in 711 AD and conquer. And we deal with uh, uh, General Tariq Ibn Ziyad and what the Moors introduce into Europe and how this leads to uh, Europe coming out of the Dark Ages. OK, so visit our website, theafricanhistorynetwork.com, theafricanhistorynetwork.com to register for this 12 week online course. Uh, we have the information at our website uh, as well. And uh, the Sunday class that I teach 
uh, black resistance movements from the Haitian Revolution to the Civil War, Civil Rights Movement, and Black Power Movement. We're doing a free class session of that uh, today, uh, Sunday, March 12, 4 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. So we have the link here in the thread of the broadcast, so you can register for that. Uh, we'll post it again here, and it's on our website, theafricanhistorynetwork.com. You can register for the full 12 week online course also. The class is on sale $80 regularly. Um, it's regularly $130. The, the content is PG 13, so you can share this content with your children. Your children can take the class also. Um, but we do the sessions live, all the sessions are archived and recorded. You can go back and watch it anytime, okay? So that's a 12 week online co course, Black Resistance Movements from the Haitian Revolution, the US Civil War, Civil Rights Movement, and Black Power Movement, 1800 to 1968. Normally we do that on Sundays, 2 p.m. to 4 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, but uh, because of daylight savings time and everybody's schedule being thrown off, as well as my schedule, we're going to do that class at uh, 4 p.m. Eastern Standard Time today. And this is the first class that I teach. We do this on Saturdays. Um, 2 p.m. to 4 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, ancient Kemet, the Moors, and the Ma'afa understand the transatlantic slave trade where they didn't teach you in school. So the next class, uh, next live class session for that, and these are taught at our online school. This is not on Facebook or YouTube, uh, is uh, Saturday, March 18th, 2 p.m. to 4 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Click right here to register for the full course. And as soon as you register, you can watch the class that we did uh, Saturday, March 11th. We had a great class Saturday, March 11th. Uh, we'll post the link here. And we have a bundle pack, so you can register for both classes at a discount, $120. That's a $300 value. There's five free lectures you're going to get that will be in the video library. Um, when you log into your Learn World account, they're in the video library. You can watch there. So you can register here for the bundle uh, bundle pack of courses, get both classes for $120. And if you've taken any of my online classes in the past, if you are a returning student, what we call a returning student, email us at ahnshow at theafricanhistorynetwork.com, ahnshow at theafricanhistorynetwork.com. You get a 50% discount on the uh, bundle pack of courses, okay? So email us there, or you can email us through the website. We'll get you registered for those. Also, you can support the African History Network, dollar sign, the AHN show through Cash App, dollar sign, the AHN show through Cash App, and through PayPal, paypal.me forward slash the AHN show. This helps us keep doing the research, stay on the air, pay some of the bills, keep broadcasting, keep doing our radio, our Sunday night radio show, the African History Network show. Um, this is our official Cash App account, dollar sign, the AHN show, S H O W. When you go to it, it'll say Michael, show my picture there. These other ones here, and there's about five fake African History Network Cash App accounts out there I've identified, and I'm still trying to get them shut down. I have to follow up with Cash App on this because they opened up an investigation. Uh, so that's why I put this graphic here on the homepage of our website and uh, with the link there and um it has the qr code uh also for our um cash app account okay so you can just scan the qr code as well all right so hopefully you learned a lot today um register for these online courses support the african history network african history network will be on live tonight sunday 9 p.m um eastern standard time for the african history network show I have to get out of here and teach this online class uh, today. Remember, right now, it's correct wrong behavior. It's not over till we win. We're kind of forever. We'll talk to you next time. Peace.